and we are live. Beautiful. Welcome once again to the Viamonstra Academy office hours. My name is Johan. I'll be your host for the next hour. This is where you can ask questions about anything related to MDT, Config Manager, Intune, Imaging, Windows, PowerShell, you name it. I absolutely love questions. So, once again, welcome. And if you have any questions, please put them either in the Q&A window for those of you that are attending this Zoom call, which you can access directly from the Academy website, or use the YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn platforms for any questions for those of you that are watching the live stream there. Uh, Twitter questions I don't see, not sure why, but they don't show up in my chat window that I have, but all the other platforms, they do show up nicely. So on that note, any questions at all? All right, so Tim has a question regarding autopilot. Let's see. Is there a way to have applications installed as autopilot that are user targeted or is that handler handled or is that better handled as a required app that is done after autopilot is done? Uh, enforcing apps through the ESP is on the device level. I haven't uh, seen a way to get user apps deployed required at that point. That might be an option to do that through scripting and whatnot, but I haven't seen it. So in that case, I, don't, I think you're on the right track there to uh, make that one uh, deployed a little bit later in, in the process. Um, as you guys know, there are differences in what you can make uh, available in Intune for deployment. So a little bit different than, than the config manager stuff, but um, you do have the option of targeting users as well. It's just that the autopilot process itself is typically focused around the device that is being enrolled into the platform. Might be doable to get user stuff in there, but I haven't I haven't tried. If anyone happens to know that on the call, feel free to chime in and comment comment uh, comments. This is after all community sessions. So here we are. We are the community. All right, thank you for the question. All right. Chad is asking, uh, I saw someone in the community that wrote PowerShell scripts to export sequences. Uh, I remember those scripts. It was actually David O'Brien who wrote the initial versions of those. Uh, I did publish updated version of those on, not on this GitHub, but on, I believe this one here. Yeah, import, export, config manager sequences. So these are some PowerShell scripts you can use to do that. Um, the way they work is basically, if I go to one of my site servers, let's see if you can see this correctly. I'm going to open it up in full screen. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, if I go here, see what we have. One sounds reasonable. Uh, so if I have a folder here that, as you guys can see, is clearly empty because I just deleted everything in it, and I run this script, it's going to just export these sequences as XML file fairly quickly into this folder. So this is obviously just the sequence itself. If you want to do a full export, you have to use the PowerShell command that for in Config Manager or right-click the sequence and do an export in the UI. But that is not going to take maybe five seconds to export 65 sequences. We, we're probably talking about a day or so to export all of those out because the, the, that export function is, is really, really slow. But this function here, you can also use to do the opposite so you can actually import sequences directly if you want to from a given XML file and that it's super instant uh, in the environment. 
Another option that I've been using over the years is um, uh, my Coster's um, SCCM monitor. It was written from back in the days, actually in the early 2007 days, but it has been updated for Config Manager 2012, and that version happened to work beautifully uh, even for current branch. So, first of all, before I forget, I will put this link in the chat for you because that way it also get added to the transcript or the, the Q&A list that we always post on the site when we're done with the sessions here. So, just make a link of this one, post in the chat when I find the chat. Promise you I have used Zoom before. Right now it's giving me a little bit of a hard time. I have a bit too many windows opened. Here we go. Here is the first link. And here is the second link. V in there. So the one that we are looking at right now is um, the event handler uh, option for this. And the way this works is it looks for events in Config Manager. In this case, it looks for a change in the sequence. So that means that every time I go to a sequence and change something, edit the description, add an action, just do an, an edit of any sorts. It's going to make an export of that sequence. So that means that in my repository here, if I go to my eDrive, SCCM monitor, this is where I have in not an XML file for each sequence, but I have a folder for each sequence. And every time there is a change, it spins up a version of that sequence. So that allows you to have like a, a versioning history, like, like you have for applications in Config Manager. When you do changes in an app, no matter what that might be, uh, you have a history of that, that you can tap into. But sequences don't have that. But by using a bit of an event handler and, and, and PowerShell, you can get it. So. This version history here doesn't yet exist on sequences. I hope that will add it. It will be a nice change. But for now, we have to use PowerShell. So I really like this solution. This is way quicker to export an XML file rather than restore a site server backup because you accidentally deleted a few sequences or somebody else deleted a few sequences for you as a favor. So yeah, long story short there, good stuff. Uh, Herman had a question regarding uh, migrating from group policies to configuration files and managing conflicts. Uh, are there any resources available uh, for this? I haven't stumbled across any like migration uh, tool or anything for going from GPOs to um, configuration baselines in Config Manager. Uh, if anyone happened to know, feel free to ping me, and I'll be happy to, to add that into the call here. But uh, the only thing I have seen a little bit of is the uh, Intune side of things, where you can basically make, if you go to the main controller and you go to where you have your policies and, and you take a policy that you have and uh, make a backup of it, basically. So in this case, this one here, I make a backup of that policy. So as you can see, if I go to manage backups, I have a backup of this deployment lab policy that I've been using on premises, obviously. And what I can do is I, I can copy that one out so this one is in this folder at the moment. So 
So I can take a copy of this one and I can go to a demo folder somewhere. Might have a copy of it here already thinking of it. Yeah, so I have a copy of that policy backup here and the policy backup contains a report of that policy. So what I can go, I can do go to endpoint or Intune, mem portal, whatever you call it, and and log in. Uh, go to devices, go to group policy analytics, and I'm going to delete the one I was playing around with earlier. So. I can go ahead and import that backed up policy or policies. So I can simply go to that like backup folder, select my, my report here, and it's going to do some validation of it, and then uh, import it. Import completed, beautiful. And it will now tell me in <laughs> either how good I am or how bad shape I am for this particular policy and I can go in and, and click the details here and it will tell me which policies that in this case works with uh, Intune and which one that doesn't uh, exist in Intune. Uh, this does not help you create configuration baselines in Config Manager but this is a way if you want to move over and do those policies managed through Intune through a co-managed scenario, for example, or if you just have Intune devices that you want to manage. So um, again, if anyone happened to know a good migration or monitoring tool to convert GPOs to config manager baselines, feel free to put it in the chat. Otherwise, uh, uh, I'm doing that. This is basically what I what I showed you right now to follow up uh, another comment on the question. Uh, this you can use to create device configuration profiles in Intune. Uh, this is the only integration I've seen here that gives like a mapping to what you have to what's available in Intune. Um, I haven't seen what that and after the fact can compare the two. Might exist, I just haven't haven't stumbled across it. I hope that answered the question somewhat. Uh, conflicting settings can be dealt with from within Intune. It will warn you if there are conflicting settings. Uh, it will tell you which one that is a conflict. There is a handler for that. Uh, but that is within the Intune policies, not the what you have locally already. All right, let's see. Question for Matt. Our organization is looking at autopilot with config manager to eventually migrate desktop laptops to Intune. Is it better to deploy the JSON file to autopilot existing devices or upload the hardware hash from the autopilot report? Are there any reasons to do it one way or the other? Well, to give some background to that question, Config Manager does support the autopilot for existing devices. What it means is that Config Manager, one of the sequence that you can create is uh, the template is uh, have that name in it. And the way this works is that you uh, backstory here. In my environment here, I have configured uh, autopilot enrollments, and I have a bunch of different profiles that I've been using. But this information here, I can retrieve through PowerShell as well. So what I can do is I can connect to my environment. Um, let's see. I put it in the autopilot. 
folder. Yeah. So I can import some Azure or PowerShell modules. I can force a, a login to uh, my my tenant. Provide my super secret password. And then I can use PowerShell to retrieve the same information as I saw in the GUI. And then I can pick one of these templates and I can export it out to a JSON file with the correct encoding, etc. So this is simply now an, a, a, a text file. holding the same information that was in that particular profile on the server. And the question was basically, is it better to provide this file or having the registration dealt otherwise? The challenge with autopilot for existing devices is timing. Because when you create those sequences, it requires a packet that holds that profile. So that, that's an easy part. So here I have a package, and if I look at the content of my autopilot package, it's just the, the particular uh, file that I showed you, an earlier version of it, but it's still that file, the JSON file. And if I take and create one of those sequences here, autopilot, this one here, autopilot, demo for office hours, pick a boot image, a high performance plan, thank you, and an image, I'm going to pick one of my, I have a 20 minute two, that will be perfectly fine, uh, client package, don't updates, no apps, and now I'm simply picking that autopilot packet that contained the JSON file, and I will show you the sequence when I'm done because um, I have, there is a line of argument here somewhere. What if you go here? What the sequence does is that after it has applied the Windows operating system, uh, it simply copies that file. It copies that JSON file to this specific folder in Windows. And then when the machine reboots, or you shut it down and ship it and then boot it up again, it's going to read that file. You can provide group tag information in this file, but what I've seen is that it kind of misses. It takes a long time for Intune to detect that this is supposed to be an autopilot deployment, so it actually misses it and, and brings up a machine that is not registered to your tenant at that point. And you may have to reset it and try again or reboot it and try again. What I found more reliable is to have the sequence do the registration. This is something we, uh, it's obviously a, a shameless plug. Uh, in many of the Intune and Autopilot sessions, there are entire blocks to our modules where we go through autopilot setups and tips and tricks around that. For example, in our Intune training, we, we do that. But to give you the, the shorthand version, uh, I prefer to have more control over the process. So I usually have either a config manager sequence or an MDT sequence. It doesn't matter. Someone that does the job for me. So if I go to this one here, this is an autopilot sequence that during imaging registered the device for in Intune for me. But it's actually not this device that does it. This PowerShell script simply gathers the hash and sends it to another server. So there is another receiving end that is running up on my deployment server or my config manager server or any server for that matter that will take care of the request. And uh, why did I put this one? No, here.
this is the server end script. It registers with uh, an app registration to get the permission it needs to do the work in the tenant. And then it starts to receive the information uh, from the, the client that did the deployment. So there is a parameter taking that body that was sent to it. And then I start to work with it. Because now I can use PowerShell on the server side to import the device. That's cool. And I can put in loops, weights, controls to make sure that the device actually have been imported. And then I can wait until Intune knows about the device and I can put in a loop to check for that. And I can start to add a device to a group. I can verify that the actual group exists uh, that I'm trying to add it to. I can assign a name, whatever name I want to the device. And then I can do the wait for the assignment to kick in. So I have a loop that waits for that. So sure, it's going to delay the deployment of that device to maybe like 10, 15 minutes at worst. But this way I can guarantee that the server side is ready for when the device is about to be rebooted or later uh, started out to, to do the autopilot experience. So I, it's a little bit more moving parts to this one, but in general, this process gives you a bit more reliability in, in general, rather than just copying the JSON file and hope that the Intune environment will pick it up in time and uh, allow you to go through the autopilot process. That was a very, very long answer to a short question, but I, I hope I gave some uh, clarification there. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was another question here on, not sure if it's autopilot or not, but what is your recommendation for registering persistent and non-persistent uh, VMs with Intune? Uh, in general, non-persistent VMs, uh, meaning VMs that we just spin up, work with for an hour, and then destroy, they are usually not the best target for systems management of any sorts, because there's always a, cha a challenge for the management system to, okay, I had a device, I was managing it, now it's gone. And no systems managed platform really likes that concept. Uh, BDI is certainly not my uh, speciality uh, at all. Uh, Don Ryan would probably be the person to reach out to and ask for management of those. Um, you can find her on Twitter. She is the master behind the Wimbridge product. But uh, I don't know a good way to manage non-persistent devices through Intune. Uh, my gut feeling tells me to stay away from it if you have the chance and basically just use whatever template you had to provide that VM with the right spec from the beginning. Um, persistent VMs is a different story because that's basically like any other client. The only thing you need to make sure is that it doesn't uh, overload your, your, your server by, for example, downloading a ton of updates, all VMs at the same time, because that will force some disk usage on that poor uh, host that needs to host them all. But there are a lot of guidance around that, uh, for sure. Both Citrix and VMware, they have pretty good guidance on what their recommendations are for VDI machines. And you can certainly apply them for any type of persistent VM that you might have in your environment. So um, not maybe the, the answer it was looking for, but that, that, that's what I uh, can offer at the moment. If I can find Donna's uh... Yeah, so this young lady here would be a good uh, uh, person to, to reach out to uh, on that question. Um, she just joined Microsoft, used to be in CDW for years and years, but 
uh, yeah, usually very helpful in the community. Um, that would be a good starting, I think. I'll put that link in the chat for you, and uh, hopefully that can help. All right. Thank you very much. I love this stitch, by the way. This is downloads amazing. <laughs> I have a feeling that product is going to outlive me even in the long run. We'll see. See what happens. On-premises platforms have a tendency to stay a bit, to say the least. All right. Any other questions? Let me take a quick look on the other channels. Uh, try to multicast, multitask as best I can, but there are limits. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So, uh, Compute Tech on YouTube is asking about any updated books, and I will probably uh, uh, just reply it with the same answer that I did uh, last time. Uh, right now, we have been focusing uh, most of our efforts on providing courses on the academy because they are fairly easy to update. Everything these days are happening in such a rapid cadence. So basically, when we are time are done writing a book, whatever we wrote about, this is kind of almost obsolete to a point. But uh, that being said, uh, we have been a little bit busy. But I think on the better side, by writing free ebooks, and uh, we're continuing to do that for for deployment. But don't expect it in. Uh, physical books from from our end at, at this point because it's been it takes between three and four months to write a book uh, in hours and that's uh, that's a lot of hours and I have normal work also so we'll see I would never say never but not right now I'm afraid so Dan is asking uh, what is the best way to get hundred machines with Enterprise N moved over to a normal Windows 10 Enterprise. Yeah, that, that would be either a refresh or a bare metal deployment to get rid of those. You can push out a refresh because the refresh is essentially a new install. If they're just a newly installed, I wouldn't bother about uh, backing up user state or restoring it afterwards. If they have been used for a while, that makes sense. But research, re, uh, refresh scenarios is actually a pretty good way of changing a platform when you simply cannot do like an addition change, like you can go from pro to enterprise uh, very easily. So yeah, definitely a, a, a refresh, which is also called wipe and load, would, would be a good option. Uh, Michael is asking, when will uninstall option on software be available in the company portal app? I have no idea. I do not know, um, fortunately. Uh, Alexander is asking, let's see. Yeah, we decided to reconfigure Pixie from using DCP scope options to use IP helpers. Uh, and after that, Basically, what are the ideas for troubleshooting that particular uh, setup? So to put this in, in, in sort of a background, I absolutely love IP helpers. They are usually the better solution for most pixie type scenarios. It does put a little bit more load on the pixie server itself because it has more work that it needs to figure out. But in even in large environments, the, the load that usually happens on a pixie server is, is fairly light. Uh, if you really want to go down the, the, the road of, of scope options, um, uh, my good friend Andreas, uh, I guess he's technically my manager these days, uh, uh, did a really detailed one for uh, the product that, that we are working with, uh, iPixie, which is um, 
Let's see if I can find that one. Uh, but this pretty much helps you also for WDS-based type deployments, or if you're using the Config Manager second pixel responder that the Config Manager team put together. Uh, you probably know you can pick two different ones in Config Manager. But this article, and I'll put this one in the chat for you. Um, and for those who are watching the live stream, these links will be published on the Academy site, uh, usually within a day from, from, from so by tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, but this one goes through uh, the entire process of configuring scope options in such a way so you support different type of architectures. So BIOS, UFI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's a bit messy. I even uh, got so tired of doing this configuration at one point, so I wrote a PowerShell script to do it, put somewhere. Yeah, this one here. Because everything you have in a Microsoft ECP server you can script. So this is a PowerShell script that creates all these policies and, and, and whatnot sets them. But I usually try IP helpers first, um, if I have the chance. Um, I'll be happy to put a link to that script in the chat. Um, um, other than that, um, I mean, we, we have some resources for, for troubleshooting. Um, and these steps, just because they happen to be for our pixel responder, they're not limited to that pixel responder. You can take these technologies and, and use for any type of pixel building. I have used this to troubleshoot config manager pixels. I've used this to WS and MDT pixels. It's basically a, a technique where you spin up VMs and you configure them for a mirroring mode, destination and sort or port, a source and destination and the mirroring mode on the port. And then you use a tool like Wireshark or, or message analyze, whatever you like and you monitor the traffic, so you can actually see what's going on on that subnet on, on, on the clients. So that, that can help with troubleshoot Pixie a bit as well. Uh, and it, it sounds like a lot of work, but you actually can spin this up fairly, fairly quickly. Um, There are also some PowerShell scripts that you can download that does like a fake pixie boot, so to speak. So if I go to this one here and run this script on an existing client, it pre pretends to be a pixie boot and it, it displays information that I would have received if I would have done the pixie boot. So it will uh, tell me basically what my uh, next server, uh, Pixie server is, what, what boot file I should use, etc. And that can also help with troubleshooting and, and speed up that process a little bit. Uh, that's great. We have up on our web page uh, on our GitHub repository uh, here. Yeah, Pixie Troubleshooter script. So that one is pretty good. And again, don't worry about it saying I Pixie here. That's just the server that, that we work with the most because we kind of develop it. Uh, but it's a good tool for sure. All right, let's see what else was in there. So, uh, follow-up question on Pixie. We are using uh, Pixie without WDS, meaning you are using the, the more updated responder in Config Manager, which is an excellent choice. Uh, this is the better one. Uh, you can also install it on clients if you want to. Uh, that one actually happened to use the same register keys as the WDS-based one. They added it in, forgot what version, 
but these here that Jorgen uh, documented back in 2016-ish, that was not the one I was looking for. Uh, ccnxec.com, so close. Uh, Jorgen's post, if you search for this one, uh, TFTP, uh, these register keys that falls for the original WPS-based responder also work with the WPS-less responder. So you can even include a tool here that you can use to set them. So I'll put that link in the chat as well. That will be added to the site. Um, what I'm talking about here is basically if you have a distribution point where you have a, a native Pixie provider, this here would be the uh, option to select without Windows deployment services. And on, on the server, only if I go to that DP, you can actually see it as a different responder service. In this case, I actually stopped it because I was Pixie booting some other service on the same subnet. And uh, well, they don't like that, so I stopped the service. But, yeah. All right. Uh, those register keys are still fully supported. It's documented somewhere. I just don't know where that somewhere is, uh, but I know they work. Any other questions? We have a whooping 21 minutes to spare. <laughs> While we are waiting for more questions, in the spirit of the community, we did have Richard Hicks coming in this morning to teach us about always on VPN. Uh, it was an hour and a half long session that turned into two hours because there were so many questions. In the end, so Richard stayed behind another half an hour and answered all of those. Uh, that recording will be uploaded tonight. So if you missed that session, by all means, go ahead and, and watch it tomorrow. It's by far the best presentations I have seen in my life about setting up always on VPN. Uh, an absolutely great session and, and the price for this one is also pretty good. Uh, we try to run these mini courses every now and then uh, and we have opened it up for, for all um, IT Pro community. So really good session around always on VPN. Give me a few hours to get the recording up and, and it will be available. All right, yes, I have a question regarding BitLocker. I know there are many methods to deploy BitLocker through Intune. Currently, I'm testing through configuration profiles rather than disk encryption with endpoint security. Does using one over the other matter? Well, it's it's uh, it's pretty interesting, I think. But as you guys know, that when when you work with Intune, especially when you work with uh, device configurations, there are different ways to apply those settings. So, as an example, when I click a configuration profile, when I create it. I can either select to pick one of the good old fashioned templates and, and pick a template I want to work with, or I can do a settings catalog and I can do often more settings from here than I can from the admin templates. And then of course you have options to 
go to endpoint security and and do uh, disk encryption settings from here as well. Uh, which one that is the best is more like, okay, what policies do you need to be able to apply? Uh, I don't really have a preference uh, on that one, but more like figuring out which one to use uh, and use that one. In general, uh, outside of BitLocker settings, uh, even though settings catalog is in preview, uh, I know a lot of customers are using this uh, for production settings because it's simply a richer option. And it's usually you make less mistakes by working with a template in the UI that is already defined versus say use some a custom CSP or something like that. Uh, I got tired of, of making typos in XML data blocks, etc. It's just it's just usually easier to use one of the built-in functions than, than, than custom CSPs. Sometimes you don't have a choice, but yeah, that would be my take on it. The, another bit like a question, can you use sequences to escrow the keys to Azure AD uh, instead of an on-premise resource? Uh, I mean, technically, yes, because you can deploy in such a way as the machine gets enrolled into Azure AD and will get the BitLocker uh, policy coming down and, and all that stuff, so that that's doable. Uh, I have not seen a script to like call for an escrow, uh, like you guys might remember the old MBAM. Uh, invoke uh, and bam something script that you would use to force a registration right away during imaging. I have not seen anything like that for Azure. Uh, but if anyone have, please, please ping me and I'll, I'll be happy to share the information. But I just haven't seen one. So there was a comment on the Zoom broadcast is being a bit blurry, but the Facebook broadcast is clear. Uh, poo. Um, let's see what can be done about that. Or some settings in video option in Zoom. No, it's already set to full HD. Um, don't know of any way to fix the blurriness there, I'm afraid. Um, the recording that I'm doing, however, is, is done locally on my device, so that one always has like the the perfect resolution, and we do all upload that one to uh, uh, to the academy when you're done. Um, I may have to do some additional tests on the Zoom recording. Uh, thing I'm doing different today and last Wednesday is I'm actually feeding an OBS feed into Zoom rather than the other way around because it allows me to basically flip around different settings, layouts very, very easily. But if that's causing blurriness, uh, it's probably not the best idea then. Thought it was a good, good combo. Um, all right. Uh, another question regarding, uh, are, are you aware of any community tools that can make export import things? Uh, like we can do in Config Manager, but, but in Intune. Uh, uh, yes, certainly. For, for the longest time, uh, when you worked with device configuration profiles in Intune, uh, you cannot click here and, and do duplicates. But they did that for, I believe, settings catalog changes recently. So if you have your settings called catalog, then you can duplicate and do changes. But what if you have a tenant over here, you tested everything in the lab, and you just want to upload that into production? 
Uh, Intune doesn't offer any really good, in my opinion, built-in good uh, import export of, of selected items, but the community has. So uh, Mickey Carlson, uh, one of the uh, folks in the Intune community, he has written a down road uh, amazing uh, management tool. He called this Intune management. Uh, so there's an application that you start. And you will log into a tenant. Uh, so for example, when uh, right now I'm in a, a demo tenant that, that me and Andrew used earlier this week in one of our trainings, but this one will, uh, for example, show me either what device configuration objects I have or what settings catalog object I have, et cetera, et cetera. And I can now go ahead and export those if I want to. So if I go export here and go to a folder, let's see, uh, can create DOA demo. Define. Ah, I don't need a company name or assignments, but you can export them as well. And then I export my selected object. And if I go over to the file system now, I do have that catalog with that object with this JSON file that now holds all these settings in them. And now I can switch to a different tenant. So I can go over to my uh, production tenant. And I can now go ahead and import the same object here. So you can use this tool to very effectively make backups and to transfer info from one tenant to another. Amazingly good tool. Uh, highly, highly recommend it. It's available at GitHub. Uh, forgot the link on the top of my head, but let's see if I can find it. It actually goes by Mickey K on Intune. There we go. I would have it somewhere. He is on Twitter as well. May not be the most, how do you say it? Uh, doesn't tweet the most, but he's there. So if you have any questions, uh, he's usually pretty good at replying. Let's see if I can find his alias. Give me a second here. Maybe we can improve his follower number a bit here uh, without the dot in the end. Here we go. This is the author behind the tool, posting changes when there are released changes. But highly recommend to follow this gentleman. Good stuff. God knows how many hours he must have done or spent creating that tool. But uh, amazing that he released it for the community. So appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Good job. Oh, let me see. Brian is asking, uh, any ideas for securing passwords in PowerShell scripts? Um, the only solution I have seen have been basically using basic hashing, and that's not really like a super secure solution in any ways because you can just reverse that later on and, and uh, 
I can't say I have seen that other than actually taking the, the files and, and compiling them to, to like executable files, etc. Makes it a little bit harder to to uh, figure out what the password is, even though if you're skilled enough, you can usually reverse even those type of, of compiled efforts. Um, so probably that. Uh, if anyone else have a good way of, of dealing with a uh, password in, in scripts, by all means, reach out and I'll be happy to share that information. But using tools like Sapien or something is probably your best option uh, for that. And that screen, by the way, is a young boy who got upset about a game, apparently. Um, let's see here. Another question, uh, what do I prefer? Uh, good old MVAM server and good policies versus BitLocker Management and Config Manager. Uh, for now, I'm going to say BitLocker Management in, in Config Manager is my preferred option. So basically, uh, using these options here uh, to deal with BitLocker Management. Uh, MVAM, even though they extended it to 2026, the support, it's not being like active developed. The Config Manager team took over this, and with every release of Config Manager, they are slowly making improvements on, on this one here. So I would, this is definitely the future. So if you're looking at setting up BitLocker Management right now on premises, this is definitely what I would recommend to do that, rather than spinning up older MBAM servers. Uh, as we have showcased many times in these um, office hours, uh, our good friends over at uh, Endpoint Manager, primarily uh, Maurice in this case, uh, he has written a, a long story, a three-part series on uh, basically converting good old MBAM into, uh, into Config Manager. So it's a great read. Uh, and then, of course, we have the master of all the guides, uh, Niall Brady. Uh, if you work with Config Manager Intune, you cannot possibly have missed his post. But he has written uh, probably hundreds of guides now of stuff. But he has a long series on BitLocker management. No, that was SQL. Let's see where the BitLocker management went. Force me to make a search. Apparently, I have to make a search. That was Intune. That was if you want to do Intune, of course. This one. Nine parts are written already. This is some good information about this. So I'm going to put the link to all the guides. Uh, Windows new our Nile Brady guides. Uh, uh, if you're not following Nile on Twitter, uh, you definitely should. He goes under NC Brady, if I remember correctly. Oh yeah, lives in Sweden, about an hour away from the town that I used to live in before jumping over the pond, but uh, please follow him. All right, let's see. Uh, there was a question about Windows 10 servicing. Um, basically, I want to deal with language packs. Um, if you want to create ready-made images with language packs, I'll say that either this solution we talked about earlier, Donna, uh, she has the Winbridge uh, user uh, it's PowerShell driven, but it has a GUI to, to work with language packs and other things in images. 
uh, uh, another really good solution for this. I'll put the link in the chat for you. Um, Currently, I can't do copy and paste, so let's try this again. And then uh, David Segura. Um, always deploy. Uh, he's always the builder tool. Also downright amazing to do changes like this. Uh, so this one here followed by that link there. And David, of course, uh, should be followed as well on Twitter. I wonder if he has a link here somewhere. I'll find it real quick. I think it's OSD Segur or something like that. Uh, Segur OSD, so close. So if you're into imaging, this is also a, a good resource to follow, Twitter. I can see a couple little bit more than I wanted. Put that in the chat as well. You will have a whole weekend to read on stuff. That's great. Boom. Da -dum. All right, that link is in. See what other questions that was out there. Uh, an MBT question uh, regarding group policies and basically local group policies. Do I have a good way to ensure that these policies are uh, are applying? Uh, not other than scripting the check for them afterwards. Uh, I haven't used local group policies in, in quite a while. Uh, they were really popular back in the XP and the, even Windows 7 uh, time frame, but I don't see it used as much anymore. I think this was the latest post I wrote about the topic. This is for Compliance Baseline Manager. Yeah, so this was back in 2011. I'm assuming some of this is still applicable but I haven't revisited this in a long, long time. Uh, my best bet, again, is to script something that, that looks for certain keys, etc., to verify that machines are compliant. Um, I, I know there are some organizations that requires local policies, and if you have work group machines, you don't really have an option. It's really hard to get Active Directory group policies if you're not part of a domain. So there is that. Uh, let's see. Will is asking um, our endpoints not seeing a distribution point, no software sequences being seen. Uh, first of all, there has been a bug lately in config management. There were policies. Uh, sometimes have disappeared and you would have to go in and basically make a change to them, like adding a dot in the description or name so that just do an update and then that will show up nicely after that. Um, I believe Mark Silva did some posting around that uh, lately. Uh, speaking of people to follow, uh, I know we're up on the hour here, but uh, this is someone you want to follow as well. He's obviously with the product team, but he is pretty good and sharing and helping uh, out in the community to get with a lot of other the product team members. So I'll put his link in the chat as well. Uh, good resources. If you follow his latest tweets, there was a thread going on around this. I remember seeing that one. Uh, other than that, in, in distribution points, uh, just make sure that you didn't accidentally set it in, in, in uh, like a maintenance mode or something like that that prevents clients from getting content from it. Uh, it doesn't have really to do with policy generation, but that's also something I've seen uh, happen a lot. So 
my goodness, time flies when you have fun, and this is fun. I happen to be uh, pretty excited when I talk about config management, Intune, and OSD, and imaging, and, and whatnot. But thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll be back again next week, I think, on the same time. I have to double check that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the following two uh, weeks in February, we're going to run at uh, 2 p.m. And then we will publish the dates for uh, March a little bit later. So once again, thank you for joining and thank you for all the good questions. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, guys.